الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام وسيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن استنى بسنته بإحسان اليوم الدين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي لولا أن هدانا الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I would like to welcome you all to another session from the commentary in the 40 hadith of Imam al-Nawi and alhamdulillah by the father of Allah we are on hadith number 22 so let us go to the recitation of the hadith from the matan عن أبي عبد الله جابر بن عبد الله على الأنصاري رضي عنهما أن رجلا سأل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال أرأيت إذا صليت المكتوبات وصمت رمضان وأحللت الحلال وحرمت الحرام ولم أزد على ذلك شيئا أدخل الجنة قال نعم رواه مسلم ومعنى حرمت الحرام اجتنبت ومعنى أحللت الحلال فعلته مؤتقدا حلا The translation of the hadith Abu Abdullah Jabir bin Abdullah Al-Ansari reported that a man questioned the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying Do you see if I pray the prescribed prayers fast during Ramadan treat the lawful as permissible and treat the forbidden as haram or prohibited, and do nothing more than that, shall I enter Jannah? He said, yes. And this is narrated by Muslim. And here Imam Nabi also adds at the end of the hadith, he says, وَمَعْنَا حَرَّمْتُ الْحَرَامْ اِشْتَنَبْثُ And treat the forbidden as prohibited is to stay away from it. وَمَعْنَا أَحْلَلْتُ الْحَلَالْ and to treat the lawful as permissible is to perform them believing that they are halal or permissible. But this is an added comment and tafsir by Imam Navi in terms of this hadith. And we don't see that very frequently in these hadith because the hadith speaks for itself in terms of its meaning. So as is our tradition, we're going to go into the life of the narrator. And here this is none other than Jabir bin Abdullah. Al-Ansari. And his kunya is Abu Abdullah. And as we see from the name, he is from the Ansar. Okay, so Jabir ibn Abdullah Al-Ansari was born in Medina 15 years before the Hijrah. Okay. He belonged to the tribe of Khazraj. Because remember, the, there was a Khazraj and there was also the Aws. Those were the two main tribes of Medina Munawwara. Jabir bin Abdullah also accepted Islam when he was a young boy. He is known to have fought at least 19 battles under the command of the Prophet ﷺ, and he was also a trusted Sahabi. And in the battle of Uhud, Jabir bin Abdullah was not allowed by his father, Abdullah, to take part in the battle because he had seven sisters. So instead of fighting, Jabir actually did the next best thing, which is he was serving the thirsty soldiers and Qadr Allah, Abdullah al-Ansari, Jabir's father, was a shaheed, a martyr during this battle, the battle of Uhud. And also his brother-in-law, Amr bin Jamuh, both again were extremely old, were at the extremes of age when they were martyred. And look at the dedication of the Sahaba, even old age did not prevent them from doing jihad. So the Prophet ﷺ, he commanded the Muslim community to clear the debt of Jabir's father before his burial because this is again he had some debt and they had to be neutralized before he could be buried because this is something which can weigh on us as we are being buried as we are going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet ﷺ commanded the Muslim community to clear the debt of this shaheed this great sahabi the father of Jabir and this also reflects the date which Jabir bin Abdullah was in because he was he was not a rich Sahabi. He was impoverished. Okay? And similarly, where the family was the family of Jabir. So, many of the Sahaba, they were in this condition. They were poor. They were needy. Uh, yet again, they did not prevent them from obedience to Allah and His Messenger. 
Jabir bin Abdullah also was one of the foremost in terms of narrating hadith. He narrated 1500 hadith. So perhaps he is after Aisha Dan or after Ibn Abbas in terms of narrators of hadith of the Prophet. And one beautiful hadith regarding the generosity of Jabir bin Abdullah is narrated in both Sahih Muslim and Sahih al Bukhari. Here, uh, Jabir said, when the trench was being dug, this is during the Battle of Khandak. Okay, this was a very difficult battle. This was during the days of distress. The people were very fearful during this battle because um, here the enemies of Islam were surrounding Medina. And so thus the Muslims decided to dig a trench. This is called the Battle of Khandak. And during this time, Jabir, he noticed, he said that I noticed the signs of hunger on the face of the Messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ. I returned to my wife and said to her, Have you got anything in the house? I've seen the signs of severe hunger on the Messenger of Allah. ﷺ. She brought out a bag which contained our sa'a, you know, approximately three kilograms of barley. And we also had a lamb which was in the home. I slaughtered the lamb and she grounded the flour for baking bread. And I then cut the meat and then put it in the quick cooking pot. When I was returning to the Messenger of Allah, my wife said to me, do not embarrass me before the Messenger of Allah and his companions. So she said this because she thought that the food would not be enough for everyone. For how can very little food cater to a thousand people, for example? So when I came to him, Ya'ni Rasul I said to him in a low tone, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we have slaughtered a small lamb and have a ground of sa'a of barley. Please accompany me with a few of your companions. Thereupon he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, announced a loud voice, O people of the trench, Ya Ahlul Khandaq, Jabir has arranged a feast for you, so all of you are welcome. And addressing me, he said, Do not take the pot of the fire, nor bake the netted bread or netted flour till I arrive. So I came home, and he came ahead of the people. My wife said, It will be a matter of disgrace for you because there is not enough food. So here the wife was extremely distraught. I said, I did only what you told me. So she brought out the netted flour and the Messenger of Allah spat into it and invoked the blessings of Allah on it. And he then spat into the cooking pot and invoked the blessings of Allah onto it. He, and then he said, call another woman to help bake the bread and let her take out from the cooking pot, but do not take it off the fire. So there were about a thousand guests, subhanAllah, all of them ate till they left the food and went off. Our pot still bubbled as before and the dough was being baked as before. Mutafaqqan alayh. SubhanAllah, a kirama of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And also narrated in Ahmad another narration, about a thousand men ate from the barley, which was about a sa'a, about three kilos of barley, and the meat of the kid. And then they left. And there was still some meat in the saucepan and bread in the oven for Jabir bin Abdullah and his family. But this is a beautiful story of Jabir bin Abdullah. Also, another beautiful story regarding Jabir and his marriage because he actually married a wife, married someone who was older than him because of, again, to take care of his family as well. Look at the concern of Jabir bin Abdullah to marry someone who would be able to take care of of not only him but also his other family as well because again his father left Jabir with seven daughters, seven siblings to take care of as well. A great Sahabi and he, Jabir bin Abdullah, also had many valuable students also who became scholars such as Imam Bakir, Muhammad bin Munqadir, Sa'id bin Mina and Asim bin Omar bin Qatada. He had a long lifespan as well. He acted very compassionately and mercifully too all Muslims, and he also was known to support Ali Wada'an versus Muawiyah during the Khilafah of Ali Wada'an. Okay, so this is Jabir bin Abdullah, one of the foremost in terms of narrators of the Sahaba Wada'an Huma. Okay, now let's go to the Muqaddimah of this Hadith. So Muqaddimah. So this Hadith talks about the million dollar question. Adkhulul Jannah? Will I enter Jannah? And this is what the Prophet ﷺ was asked. The man went and asked the Messenger of Allah about the minimum requirements. And it is a question that we should ask ourselves frequently because everyone will be called that day. This is a day when literally people will be drowning literally in their sins. 
And on their right hand, they will have the good deeds. On their left hand, they will have their bad deeds. People will be extremely distraught when they hand in their kitab on their left hand or behind their back. While on their right hand, it will be immense, unfathomable joy. May Allah allow us to get our book of deeds in our right hand. Because on that day again, this is the day, this is Yawm Al-Qiyamah. This is where no one will have iota of a doubt of what the reality is. Okay. As people unfortunately do today, so much doubt, so much raib. Okay. La raib afi. Okay. There will be no doubt about that day. Okay. So we should be prepared. Adkhulul okay. Jannah. This is a question we should ask ourselves frequently. And this hadith highlights the minimum required which is to be fulfilled by every Muslim, which is practicing the obligations and avoiding the prohibitions. Again, a concept which we have seen again and again and again through these beautiful hadith. Okay, so by fulfilling the minimal requirement, any person is deserving of Jannah. Okay, this hadith also highlights the yusr of Islam and the hikmah of Islam. The ease and wisdom of this great deen. Okay. And in this hadith, only the obligations have been mentioned or were mentioned by the questioner. The minimum obligations, yani many Muslims cannot do hajj because of their, their poverty. Many Muslims cannot give zakah because of their poverty. But every Muslim is enjoined to do the salah and to do the psalm. Like this sahabi. So in this hadith, Imam Nawi also, as we mentioned, provides an explanation he says and to treat thee forbidden as forbidden, like to stay completely away from it. Again, remember, ma nahaytuk wa anhu fashtanibu, okay? Wa ma amartukum bi fatu minhum mastatatu. And from the meaning to treat the law for as permissible is to do as much as you can, as from Hadith number nine. But also here is to perform them believing and to have the aqidah that they are halal. This highlights the importance and the necessity of believing in the Sharia of Islam. The Sharia, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is testing our Iman as well. And unfortunately, some from the Ummah have issues with the Sharia. Okay. This is part of our Aqidah, this is part of believing Allah and His Messenger. We cannot have any doubt in the Sharia. Okay. There is ikhtilaf with certain issues, but in general, the main frame for the Islamic law is the Sharia. So this also, this hadith highlights that as well. Okay. Going forward. Okay. And interesting part of this hadith is where the Sahaba says, He says, وَلَمْ أَزِدْ أَلَى ذَلِكَ شَيْئًا okay. I will not add anything to this. Okay. And so who was this questioner? Was he taking the easy road out? Okay. What was he saying with this? What's the, I mean, this is, is this an attitude we should have? No, we have to have a proper perspective of this hadith. This, this hadith can easily be misinterpreted. And the questioner actually was a Sahabi by the name of An Nu'man ibn Kawqad. He said in another narration of this hadith, by Allah, I will not add anything to it. Okay. Similarly, there's other hadith like this, where, for example, another narration, a Bedouin came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Point me to the deeds that if I were to perform them, I will enter paradise. Okay, another hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, He said, Worship Allah and do not associate anything with Him and establish the salah and give the zakah and fast in Ramadan. He said, By the one in whose hand is my soul, I will not add anything to this. This is another narration of this hadith. The Bedouin who asked the Prophet ﷺ said this. He said, By the one in whose hand is my soul, I will not add anything to this. Okay, being a minimalist. Then the Prophet said, did he blame him? He said, Dakhal al Jannah in Sadaq. He will enter Jannah if he is truthful. And that is the caveat to this hadith. That if we are truthful completely to and committed to this hadith, we will enter Jannah even if we do not add any single additional thing on top of this. Ya'ni an nafil action, a sunnah action to this. The point is that these just highlight the importance of the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the things, the far actions that have been commanded on us. 
nothing can equal those. We have to fulfill those. So similarly as some of the ummah, people of the ummah are increasing some of the nawafil while they're neglecting the obligations, they're just fooling themselves. And we'll see also another important hadith later on which talk about the importance of the fard and also the importance of the nafal actions, how it increases and elevates the abd to the level of a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyway, so dakhal al-jannah in sadaq. He will enter jannah if he is truthful. So the minimum requirement. This hadith again, as I mentioned, should not be misread. Again, the context of this sahaba is not that he's actually asking the easy road out. It's not that. It's not that he just wants to neglect the nafal actions. No, that's not the point. The point is that his focus is Jannah. He wants to be simplistic. Many of the Sahaba, they spend much of the day working hard, laboring, toiling in the farms or wherever in the desert. They didn't have much in terms of sustenance. They were out there trying to put bread on the, on the table. At the same time, to earn Jannah. So it was not an easy life where you had to go out for water. It was not like you could just open up the faucet, turn on the electricity. No, this was difficult terrain, difficult life. And these were the Zahaba. So, this hadith should not be misread. The obligatory actions mentioned in this hadith lead a person to Jannah. They require a strong belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they also require commitment with continuous effort, sabr, istiqamah. With consistency of these few deeds, the path to Jannah is easy. And this hadith also highlights the ease and wisdom of Islam, where the Prophet ﷺ said to Mu'ad bin Jabal, Yassiru la tu'assiru. Make easy, O Mu'ad. Do not make difficult for these new Muslims in Yemen. For example, he was going to teach the people of Yemen Islam. And then Allah Subhanahu also says, as we have mentioned this ayah from the Quran several times, Yuridullah bikumul yusr, wala yuridu bikumul usr. So this hadith highlights our viewpoint on Islamic law also and the Sharia. Those tenets are fixed. So, as it's mentioned in the Quran, the hadith, riba is always going to be haram. Okay. Khamar or muhaddirat, drugs, right? Those things which intoxicate are always going to be haram. Whether it's legal to smoke marijuana, it's always going to be haram. Zina, illicit relationships, they're always going to be haram. Regardless of what the society is telling you, regardless of what the TV is telling you, or the film industry or Bollywood is telling you. Homosexuality is also going to be always forbidden in Islam, regardless of what the society is trying to teach you. Like, for example, one of my friends, he works in the Board of Ed um, as a teacher in New York City, and they've now made it incumbent one day in terms of the teaching of these children to teach them about how homosexuality is okay. okay so this is basically the, the society in which we're growing up our kids. So this is something which is mutlaq, you know, always forbidden for Islam, regardless of what's unfortunate society is going towards that trend. Okay. So lawful here means okay, what is things which are not prohibited. And this include the wajibat, the mustahab and the mubah. I mentioned before that in general any action, whether it's dunyai or dini, can be split into five different things. Number one, something which is fard. Wajib, something which is mustahab, encouraged, recommended, which we get a hasnat for, but is not required. Number three is something which is muba or allowed action, which we may or may not get any hasnat for, depending on our niyyah. Number four, something which is makruh, disliked. And number five, something which is haram. Okay. So one thing to note also about this hadith is that the hajj and zakah were not mentioned. And there are reasons for this as well. Again, I mentioned that this is not something which necessarily is obligatory on every Muslim because they are poor people. They are people who are, cannot do the zakah, cannot do the hajj because of monetary reasons. For the hajj, for example, you can have an excuse for medical issues. For example, you're on chemotherapy, have cancer, uh, immunocompromised. Extremely common to get really sick in hajj as well. Or you may not have the physique or capacity. You may not even be perhaps 
given the visa for Hajj, you know, or if you're a woman and do not have a maharam, that's another valid excuse for not doing the Hajj. So the caveat, okay. and that is sidq, okay. truthfulness. To be truthful for what you are testifying to. Yani amantu billah. So if you are truthful, then Jannah will be easy. If you have true iman and believe completely and die on that state, inshallah, a done deal. However, we have to deal with shaitan. We have to deal with temptations. We have to deal with fitan or trials and tribulations and also tests. So it's not an easy road. However, it's easy for the one who wants to make it easy, yani if he or she is truly truthful and acts on that truth, then inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy, despite the seemingly difficult terrain that we have to go through on the sirat. So number one, we have to be honest with ourselves. No wishful thinking. You know, many times, many Muslims, they're out there and they have the belief that, that they're going to Jannah. Believing or testifying to La ilaha illallah while there's no reflection from their, their limbs or their tongues that they are indeed testifying to that. Lip service. It's not about lip service. It's about doing. Doing. Actions. A'mal. Okay, we have to be honest with ourselves about how we are practicing the religion. You can make an excuse for anything. You can make an excuse for missing out any obligation. If you are going through a red light, you can make all the excuses you want. You're still going to be fined. Because you transgressed, you transgressed the law. Right? Uh, rarely is there going to be concession made. So similarly, when you fail on the wajibat, when you uh, transgress the huramat, the haram matters, then don't make excuses. Now make tawbah and act on it because if those laws are there in the dunya like that. And similarly, the accounting is not going to be that far off. And yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be much, much, much more lenient. Okay. But we have to be honest with ourselves. Don't play games. Like Bani Israel, they played games. Like with the Sabbath, they played games. Don't play games like how Bani Israel did. You know, with the Sabbath and the other things. Making excuses and not having the sidq and the sincerity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demands from us because this truth this religion is all about sincerity okay so we have to be honest with ourselves quality over quantity ihsan do those actions with ihsan it's not just about doing the checklist but it's about really doing it and feeling in your heart we're not robots we're not drones this religion is a beautiful religion and you feel it if you're not feeling it then there's some problem there it's not going through the heart and remember, uh, one formula we mentioned before, that the weight of a good deed is equal to action, right? the action itself times the iman. So when you infuse a lot of effort, love, and devotion to that action, then it's going to be multiplied. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to count your deeds. He's going to weigh them. So the weight is huge. It's all about the iman. If you have a huge deed and there's no iman, then it becomes a zero. So weight of a good deed, again, iman is, has to be there. Okay. Sidq, sincerity, ikhlas, and also doing it with ahsan, having taqwa, being aware. All those concepts, those important concepts which we, these ahadith talked about before, we're basically putting it all together. Okay. All the puzzle pieces are fitting together and all the bricks are coming together to make this nice house of Islam. Okay. So, Next is the whole issue of the nawafil. If you misread this hadith, then you will not have the proper perspective because this hadith does not tell you to not do the nawafil. No, that's irrelevant. That's not the point of this hadith. Okay. Basically, the question is, do we need the sunnah in order to enter paradise? Any sunnah meaning, this is not talking about the sunnah of the Prophet in terms of a concept as in hadith number 5, but again, the terminology is the Mustahabdid, something which is recommended to earn hasana, to earn a reward. But it's not binding or obligatory on you. Yani if you do not do that recommended deed, it doesn't mean that you're going to be penalized for it. But do we need the sunnah in order to enter paradise? That is a very important question. Because 
it may be a yes, it may be a no. For this Sahabi who was true in Sadaqah, Dakhalul Jannah. So if you are truthful, then yes, you will be able to enter Jannah. But the truth of the matter is, we make mistakes. You know, we are insan. And particularly us, we're not the Sahaba. So we're going to falter much more. If we fail on the obligatory deeds, then we have to rely on something else to sort of push us up, right? Some brownie points, some extra credit. And that is the sunnah. Those are the mustahab deeds. Those are the nawafil, preferable, supererogatory. You know, there's like four different terminology in the Arabic language that we have gone through. So those are the needs that we are going to rely on to get us past our deficiencies, our image in the obligatory ibadat. So most of us, perhaps we will need them. Okay, so just one thing from this hadith is that mm-hmm. number one, fulfilling the obligatory actions has no equal. So you can't just rely on the sunnah and you're doing haram actions and you're going to do a hajj every year to make up for those haram. No, that's not how it goes. Don't play games with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have sincerity. But for the mu'min, he will do the sunnah actions. Number one, for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he wants to. He wants to do as much as possible. But at the same time, this will also help him or her in case he falters or slips. Okay, And all of us are liable to slip. None of us are perfect. That's very important. Do not be overconfident in this deen. Okay. So we are encouraged to perform the preferable deeds according to our capacity and whenever possible. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He loves those, He loves those actions which are regular, qal, even if they're little. Okay. And the significance of performing the preferable or the mustahab actions that they help us get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and compensate for the shortcomings in our obligatory actions. As we alluded to earlier, most would adhere strictly to the obligatory, the farud. Find the nawafil indispensable in their lives. It just adds more pop and power to those farud. I mean, think about, for example, when you go into the masjid to do fajr salah, and you haven't done the sunnah. How could you not do the sunnah? Or try to at least. When the, the hadith is so strong encouraging you. I mean better than the world and what is in it. That's the, the ni'mah of the sunnah of the fajr salah. But, and what about the fard? The fard is even more, right? So anyway, this is how the nawafil are indispensable. Just like how the sunnah of the fajr salah is. But you can't compare the sunnah of the fajr to the fard of the fajr prayer. Because... If it is sounded, if the Iqam is Salah is sounded, the Hadith in Bukhari is very clear. You have to leave even the Sunnah of the Fajr Salah and join the Fard Salah as per the authentic Hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. And it shows you the importance of the Fard Salah, that there is no equal. Even, you know, you can't compare the Fard of the Fajr to the Sunnah of the Fajr. So despite the great ni'mah which is in the Sunnah of the Fajr, it is basically again a parable in terms of how the comparison is between the Sunnah and the Fard actions. So the important balance and connection between Wajib and the Nawafil Act, this is the Hadith, Hadith number 38. Okay, if you want to look at it, look at it. Beautiful Hadith. And um, just, uh, again, just these hadith just give you such love and appreciation for the depth and the wisdom that the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Mursaleen, the, the master of the uh, messengers is giving us. So another wisdom which this hadith gives is depicting the great teaching ability of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. So he had great perception, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of what the questioner needs. Okay. And this is a great lesson. And we see this again, time and time again from these ahadith of the Prophet This is a great lesson for our teachers, for our murabis, for our scholars, for us as parents. You know, that you need to read between the lines of the questioner, of the one who you are advising, whether it's your children, whether it's a colleague, whether it's a loved one, okay, whether it's a fellow student, if you are a teacher in that capacity. Read between the lines. Tailor the answer to the questioner's needs 
or the student's needs. Don't just spoon feed the same answer for the same question. It's not that simple. Okay, this is why we need hikmah. That's why look at the Prophet Sallallahu responses to, I mean, Sahabi would ask for advice. He would, would he give the same advice? No, he would tailor it to what they need and what's best for the situation. Okay. This requires depth hikmah. This requires backing of Quranic knowledge. To have great akhlaq to lower yourself to the one who's asking the question. Okay, this, this takes some experience in, and we need to try to practice also this. Also have patience with the ones we are advising as well. So people may have the same problem, yet the solution they need will be different. And that's why da'wah requires the human connection. It requires prophetic wisdom and guidance. The same solution often will not work for a person who comes from a different background, different culture, different economic setting. Okay. Thus, du'at, or those who give da'wah, and murabbis, the ones who are teachers, should familiarize themselves with the background, the questioner, before advising them. Before someone gives advice, let them take a step back. Because what they're doing, what they're going to be giving, perhaps is extremely important. So everyone's different, everyone's at different levels. And some are thriving in the deen, so the advice you may give them may be too simplistic. Okay? While others... They are barely surviving, so the advice you may give them is too complicated, too difficult. Some are on life support, barely alive. Okay. Some are comatose, they're zombies, they're practicing the deen as a ritual, and they have been doing so for years, and they think everything's okay. Some are addicted to certain sins and certain problems. Some have external problems, like their environment, peer pressure, etc. Some have problems with their families. And some people, they have problems within themselves, even though they think others have the problem. I mean, everyone's at different levels, different backgrounds. So if you don't know the person, it's more difficult to give advice. So this is where your perception comes in. Is it our job to give them what they need? Of course. I mean, if we do not give it or help them out, who will? The local imam or sheikh cannot help everyone. The people who have the problems, most of them are not going to come to their local imam or scholar or the person who is capable. Often, we may be their only source of guidance. So again, do not shy away. Do not have khajal. Do not chicken out. Give them what they need and do not wait. If someone is in need of advice, this may be their last opportunity. If you know the answer, give it. And add to it after you get more advice from your shuyuk or from your murabbi or from your scholar, etc. Okay. This is important because this life is very fast-paced. These are the times we're living in. A lot of doubt, a lot of fitna, fitan, and a lot of confusion. So da'wah with wisdom. So it is not the scholar's job. It's your job. It's my job. It's everyone's job to do da'wah. And Sheikh bin Baz, for example, since da'wah in general is farad kifaya, it's a community obligation. But since the community is not doing da'wah, his fatwa or his judgment was that da'wah is incumbent on every person because no one's doing da'wah. The community is not doing da'wah. So now it becomes incumbent on the individual to give da'wah as well. So unfortunately, all of us, including myself, we're deficient in our da'wah. We need to give more da'wah as much as we can. Some scholars have extrapolated from this hadith that the person, the Sahabi who was asking the question was new to Islam. This gives more insight for the teachers when dealing with new Muslims, new converts, or people who have been Muslim, but now they're actually finally practicing. Now they're finally true Muslims. And now they're finally praying. They often barely know how to read the Quran. They barely know the fiqh rules. So we have to also deal with these people, these beautiful Muslim brothers and sisters who are new to the deen, even though they were lost for a little bit, in the same manner. And as we mentioned before in prior hadith, we have to give nasiha with care, with courtesy, with the best of matters. Like medicine needs to be given with the proper dosage and type. Similarly, nasiha advice, Quranic and hadith advice needs to be given with care, courtesy, best manners. Look at the da'wah training seminars from Dr. Bilal Phillips, like uh, Hamza Tortoise and other uh, da'is that was different than 
doing a class on fiqh. It's completely different. It's, it's a different mindset to open the door for someone to enter into Islam. This is a lifetime of deeds because now you have someone come to the deen and perhaps also their family members and generations are going to come to the deen, subhanAllah, because of one conversation you had about the deen. But this is why that was so important. Be perceived as a velvisher, not a preacher. People don't like to be preached to. You're not here to lecture them. Don't be a lecturer. Be a friend. Be a well-wisher. Okay. To the point where if they also were to give advice, you would also listen with the same attentiveness. So it goes both ways, right? And also, of course, focus on the priorities. Okay, Focus on the priorities. Give them a plan of action and then go down the list of priorities. So when someone knows nothing about Islam, then you're not going to say, well, Islam is about peace. I mean, it's about la ilaha illallah, no God but Allah, Tawheed, and Rasul, that Muhammad Sallallahu is a messenger of God, just like Isa, just like Musa alayhi salam. Don't complicate them in things which are just wishy-washy. And number one, again, the Shahada, the tenets of faith, one God, and give them the Quran. This is basically the book of God. This talks about who God is. These are the people who God sent as the messengers and prophets. Beautiful stories also of those who God has favored. This is the Quran. And of course, avoid complicated fic issues, avoid politics. Politics will often polarize people, soften their hearts, do not provoke their sensitivities. Yassiru wa la tuassiru. Very important. Don't attack their religion, it doesn't help at all. Show them the haqq, inshallah, and if they are truthful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide them. New Muslims are bombarded from many different angles. Their priorities are different. And you have to understand that they are likely, sometimes you are very likely to give up their faith. Because they are, again, their whole family is not Muslim. They face so many stressors. And often, many times, shaitan becomes right there after them. He's going to be doing extra waswas to try to bring this new Muslim away back to into the nar, the hellfire. So we see from this hadith that new Muslims should not be overburdened or be asked to perform preferable acts first. They can certainly be asked to do that later on when they're ready for it. But number one, the fard. Focus on the fard. Okay. And again, this can, same could be said of those Muslims who have little knowledge or those astray Muslims, as we talked about, who are striving to come to the straight path. Okay. So number one, these new Muslims on the path should be consistent first in the obligatory matters. Their da'wah should be makki, not madani. Again, the tenets of faith, the basics of faith, okay? not the complicated fiqh issues right now. So their fiqh is def keep the Muslim number one. Focus on tawheed and the salah. No wine or swine diet. You don't complicate them with saying that, okay, it has to have this, this, this in it. You can't eat from McDonald's or Burger King. Or You want to make sure they don't go back into kufr. They perhaps haven't even taken the cross off their chest yet. Uh, once I remember one, one brother became Muslim, and on the second day, one brother goes, okay, so when are you going to change your name? I mean, he hasn't even learned how to pray the prayer, and you're now focusing on his name. No proper perspective. We really don't have perspective. We don't know about the priorities. Focus on Tawheed and then the prayer. No wine or swine, diet. Aqidah first, second, and then other things. Aisha, in fact, she said that the first thing to be revealed was do not drink alcohol or alcoholic drinks. People would have said, we will never leave alcoholic drinks. There had been revealed, do not commit illegal sexual intercourse. They would have said, we will never give up illegal sexual intercourse. This is Aisha. Anha. So if they are given too much, if you preach to them this fiqh about what not to do, preacher versus being a well-wisher, then they'll be overburdened. They may lose interest in Islam. It'll be too harsh. So the murabbi should start slowly and the preferable act should be introduced to them when the new Muslim is firm on performing the obligatory deeds. Of course, again, the priorities are priorities. So similarly, new Muslims or those with limited knowledge should not be introduced to controversial or advanced topics in Islam. For example, in the beginning, they should not be directed to follow one of the four major madahid. This will only confuse them. 
The Murabbi should make it easy and simple for converts to start their new lives in Islam, and such issues should only be discussed with them much later, or when they're ready. The same thing can be said about the general public as well. That's why in the Juma Khutbah, at least most Imams and Shuyuk are cognizant enough not to discuss fiqhi issues on the member. The community is not ready for it, and often they're just too sensitive. They're not mature enough, number one. This is an academic issue, right? Fiqh, like the whole issue about halal meat, the whole issue about moon saying, these are, these are academic issues. Okay? These are not issues which should be voiced or discussed on the member because the public in general, they're not ready for it. They're just going to cause more confusion. We're just not at that level. But this is not the time. I mean, the education level is so low. I mean, literally, there's so much illiteracy, Islamic illiteracy, it's rampant. Even in this country, we're everywhere, it's just ridiculous how illiterate people are and how ignorant people are in the Muslim Ummah. And this is just a reflection of going away from the deen. So altogether, putting everything in perspective with this beautiful hadith. Number one, will I enter Jannah? This is a question we should ask ourselves frequently. And this Sahabi asked this question because he was keen on entering Jannah. Okay. He wanted a small path and wanted to be truthful to it. And this is why the Sahabi said what he said. Okay. And number two, obligations have no equal. Okay. The, uh, the farad are essential, just like how you cannot equal and compare the Turaka Sunnah of the Fajr Swala with the farad of the Fajr Swala. Similarly, Obligations have no equal. Entering Jannah is easy for the one who has sincerity and who is true. Okay. But for the one who is not, then it becomes difficult. Belief in Islamic law and the Sharia cannot be undermined. This is basically a prerequisite to entering Jannah. To have that faith in the Sharia, laws of Allah, the hudud Allah, that it is, has to be firm in order to enter Jannah. The Nawafal actions, despite what, if you misread this hadith, you will have the wrong perspective of the Nawafal. The point here is not to undermine the Nawafal, no. The point is to prioritize the Farud. But Nawafal actions are our backup for the Mizan, the scales on Yom Al-Qiyamah. It may be our lifeline for that because all of us are deficient and some of the Ummah are much more deficient than others. And this is where the Nawafal perhaps may save them. We are all du'at or callers to Islam. Okay, and we need to reach the hearts with wisdom, care, and sensitivity. Okay. We should make Islam easy for others just like how Allah wants ease for us. Okay. And may Allah give us tawfiq from the prophetic guidance from these hadith treasures. Jazakallah khairan for your attendance. And may Allah again allow us to be du'at and da'is uh, to this beautiful message to, to these hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Subhanaka lahu hamdik wa nashhadu wa la ila illa antum wa sakfakutubu wa alaykum assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.